Welcome to the Expansive CEO Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Chapman, founder of Expansive CEO and X Squared Wealth Planning. Buckle in as we explore how to create true prosperity and build a business and a life that expands beyond yourself and makes a dent in the universe. Welcome everyone to this episode of the Expansive CEO Podcast and Investment Fridays with Mr. Brad Haynes, the Chief Investment Officer of Juncture Wealth Strategies. He is sitting right here across from me right now. Right. Brad, here. what's up? Not much. Markets, certainly not. But that we'll get to that. <laughs> but... We'll get to that. Yeah, that's right. T- today, right now, it is Thursday, September 28th at 4.17 p.m. Eastern Time. So that is the timestamp on this. And actually the markets ended up, the markets, the major indices ended slightly up for today. But what else has been happening? This has been um, a follow on really from last week when we talked about, and two weeks ago, the um, the UAW strike, the United Auto Workers strike, the um, impending basically government shutdown uh, that's scheduled for September 30th, which is in two days. Um, yeah, some of that stuff is still in play, right? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, I think the volatility in the equity markets, which it's up today, but it was really down yesterday. And so, and actually from its, uh, you know, mid midterm peak or short-term peak or high um, in the, at the end of July, early August, it's down about six and a half percent, the S&P 500. Um, and most indices, equity indices are actually barely positive for the year or actually slightly negative for the year in terms of year-to-date return. And that is being masked a lot in the in the S&P 500 or the Russell indices because they are, um, they are capitalization weighted. So again, those very large tech companies we've talked about a number of times this year have done extremely well. And because they're so overweighted relative to the others, um, if you know, though they're having an outsized impact on those headline, those headline indices, but most equities or a lot of equities, the average equity is barely positive. We're actually slightly negative this year so far. Interesting. So what are we, well, one of the things that we talked about, um, before we started recording was the 10 year, 10 year treasury. Um, and kind of what's happening there, because as the yield shifts on the 10 year treasury, that's a lot of why we're seeing this negativity in the equity markets, right? So can you speak to that? You mentioned that the 10 year is actually at a weird spot right now. Can you explain what that means? Yeah. So the whole reason, or one of the main reasons that we're having weakness in the equity markets is because the the longer term treasury yields are starting to adjust to the reality that they might we might have higher interest rates for a longer period of time than than they expected. So people are or investors in the bond market are are making those adjustments meaning those prices are coming down, those yields are coming up. So longer term treasury yields are starting to come up with long to, or short term rates coming up a little bit, okay? So what that's doing is it's steepening the yield curve, Mm -hmm. meaning the rates in the longer term are coming up faster than the, than the yields in the short term. And so that's, that's an important, I, that's important to understand because what happens is as an investor, as a portfolio, you're sitting here and you're saying, well, you know, if I can get six, 7% on some high grade credit corporate bonds, why would I need to take the risk of all of my assets being in the the equity markets? You know, mm-hmm. they're 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 fairly priced, if not a little more on the expensive side. Um I could probably sell out some of my on the margin, trim some of my equities that that I would rather not have as much of and purchase some 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 bonds at six to seven percent interest rate or yield. And that's guaranteed as long as the issuer doesn't go bankrupt and and as long as I uh, 
as long as I don't sell it prior to maturity. So I think a lot of that reallocation effect is is starting to happen towards, you know, in September, but also towards the end of the year, as yields continue to adjust higher in the longer term, you'll have people start to to make those that decision. Mm. So this again, we've talked about, you know, kind of the, the similar effect um, several times as well, but it seems like it's getting more entrenched now yes. than it was even earlier this year um, with those longer term treasury yields coming up because it had been inverted for a while, right? Where the, which means like the two year, the five year, those ones are, are higher than the longer, the 10 year, the 20 year, the 30 year. So that's an inverted year, yield curve when you get more money for a short time and less money for investing for a long time. That's what it means when the yield curve is inverted. Um, so now we're starting, so we're seeing this start to write itself, right? Where, which is what you would expect as a, as a consumer. Like if I'm going to give you my money for 20 years, I expect you to give me more interest than if I were to give it to you for two years, right? Like that's the. Exactly. Cause you're locking it up, taking the uncertainty of what's inflation going to be, you know, over the, over that 20 year period, you have to be compensated for uncertainty in those longer maturities. And the last couple of years, we haven't been. Well, I think now bond, the bond market is starting to adjust to the fact and listening to Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve uh, committee members saying, we are going to be higher interest rates for longer. And if people go back and they look at, like, for example, the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield, the average yield over a long, long period of time is, is not 4.5%. It's much higher than that. You know, it's 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 much, much higher than that, actually. Um, and so it's not unreasonable to expect that as inflation is coming down, that inflation, that inflation component is still there, but you have to add in that uncertainty term premium is what we call it, um, to lock up your money for that long term. Uh, so we're starting to see that. Uh, there's some also some trading issues going on, i.e., there's a lot of treasury supply coming on online. The U.S. Treasury is is issuing a lot of bonds and 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 uh, and bills, and hoping or not hoping, having having to have the yield be attractive enough to to entice investors, um, because the Federal Reserve obviously is stepping out of that game. They're 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 not buying as much, and so as they shrink their balance sheet. They're not the marginal buyer anymore. It's it's the retail investor, it's the institutional investor, and the the government policy investor, the central bank investor around the world. Mm, okay. So then in that sense, you mean like when other countries buy US treasuries as a store of safety, um, that kind of thing, making more available to those types of buyers, the retail buyer, the the institutional buyer. Um uh, versus the Federal Reserve buying up so much of that themselves. Exactly. I mean, the Federal Reserve had to buy treasuries because it was a policy, and they were implementing that policy when they were in quantitative easing, and they were purchasing these these bonds and, and growing their balance sheet and making the financial markets and the real economy much more liquid, okay? Well, now we're in the reverse of that, where they're in quantitative tightening, where they are shrinking their balance sheet, meaning liquidity is drying up in the financial market and in the real economy. And so what happens is when you lose a large buyer of your of your good, um, you have to make that good attractive, i.e. via price in terms of bonds, in, in the sense of bonds, you make that price more attractive and that yield attractive enough to entice them to buy it. And I want to um, clarify the language one more time here. So when we're talking about the yield on a bond, that's the interest rate that you get paid for having yes, that's holding your on to the bond. Yeah. yeah. So there's 
we could do a whole episode probably on how bonds work and why, you know, what happens when the price fluctuates itself, what happens to the yield or the interest rate that you get as the um, investor. Um, so, because that's, that all plays into what's happening here. Very because, much so. Because as those interest rates go up, like we're saying, this is the, this is the uh, cog maybe, or the, um, the piece of machinery, right. That's, that's shifting. That's making equities kind of fluctuate, falter a little bit. Right. Exactly. I mean, if you go to the corporate bond market, you can find six, six and a half percent high, high credit quality bonds. And a lot of investors are saying, do I really need to have a hundred percent of my assets and equities? If I'm looking to retire or if I am retired or if I'm just more conservative as an investor, um, you know, I, up until the last couple of years, there hasn't been that option. Bonds have been paid very, very little. Um, it, it was kind of a terrible investment in, in the sense of, of cash flow. Well, now cash flow is, is up. Your interest rate is higher, much higher. And if you lock it up and you're happy with that return, you know, if you buy an individual bond, as long as the issuer doesn't default and you hold on to that bond to maturity, you're guaranteed or trust that yield to maturity. And so that's an important aspect for investors that are more conservative, that maybe have too much equity in their portfolios uh, relative to what they're really comfortable with. Okay, so... We're we're going to talk about a couple of other things that are happening in the market as well, but this actually, I, I wanted to bring this up because it's relevant. Um, and we didn't have a specific question this week, but it brought up a question that was asked um, where, hey, can I just do 100% of my portfolio in bonds? And when I think about that, what is the actual... Um, so my concern with that is inflation, right? So that if you're guaranteed 7% for, let's say the, let's say a longer term one, like a 20 year corporate bond, will pay you 7% per year. You've got taxes that you're going to pay on that, right? So your effective yield is going to be lower, maybe more in the five and a half, six percent. Um, is that actually enough over the span of 20 years because that's not a compounding return. It's different, right? From our literally from our compounding returns that we get on our our stock portfolios or anything where you're reinvesting into the investment. So is that actually a safe haven for large chunks of your portfolio given inflation or is it more like hey, now we can right size our portfolios to maybe 40 or 50% fixed income into those bonds and still have that inflation hedge, that compounding interest hedge with equities. What do you think? Yeah. So I would say any investor can do that. The question is whether they should do that. Yes. And, and, and so that is the, that's the, the fun thing about working with investors is, you know, at the click of a switch, they can do that. But the problem is, is what you were identifying is one, you have to identify your biggest risks to your portfolio at any at any stage in time. And if you are preparing for retirement or retired, but you have a potential of 10 to 20 to 25 years left of life, then your biggest risk is not interest rate risk, duration risk, equity volatility risk. It's inflation risk. It's purchasing power risk. And so you know, my encouragement is, is if you're in that stage and you are more conservative and you do want bonds, then look at your financial plan, talk to your financial planner or your financial advisor and, and work that into the plan. Now I will make an exception because I do know individuals uh, that we have as clients that are mostly bonds but they only live on a very small portion of the income it provides. Mm, okay. So in, in effect, they're reinvesting 
most of their income off their portfolio back into the portfolio. And so, you know, uh, so it's the, people can do it. It's just a very rare circumstance that I've seen that someone is able to put a hundred percent of bonds and, and live on that for a longer period of time. And so I would encourage people to, again, talk to their financial advisor um, and, 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 but definitely make sure that you're addressing the biggest risk in the room, which is if you have a long time frame left in your life, it's probably inflation. Okay. I, that helps so much. And actually that, that example that you just gave, um, I think is really powerful because yeah, if you can, if you're netting, let's say five and a half percent after taxes on your bonds, but you're only spending two to 3% of your portfolio, you have a spread to protect against inflation exactly. where if you are, you know, if it's more like, no, we need five to 6% of the portfolio each year in order to cover all of our expenses, that's where it's like, okay, you want to be shooting for seven, eight, nine percent per year, right? Because you want that spread because that's the protective part. It's the actual spread between what you're taking and, you know, what you're growing, basically. Yeah. As a, as a general rule, when I started managing money, uh, many years ago, the general rule is what, and again, this is a general rule of thumb is if you were in retirement and you had a number of years left, the minimum you wanted was 30% in equities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the reason why there's no, there's no magic about the number 30%. It was over time, 3% inflation has been the average since post-World War II. Well, if you do 30% times 10% average equity return, 30% times your allocation, your, your return of 10% is 3%. Mm. So it matches your inflation. So periodically what happens is your equity portfolio grows to 35, 40%. And then you rebalance, you take that 10% Re gain out of equities and buy more bonds. Then you have, again, a 30% equity portfolio, 70% fixed income, and you can do that. Now, again, we're, we're far more advanced nowadays with projecting that out. So please, I do not want anybody to take that rule of thumb and, and run with it. Please talk to your financial advisor about going through your financial plan to determine what the port, what the right portfolio is for you, given your objectives and your risk tolerance. Yeah, that's a that's a beautiful reminder, and mixed in with the hey, the inflation hedge, the inflation protection, is a really integral part of your portfolio. No matter what, like we need to we need to take that into account when we're looking at long term projections. So you mentioned a rule of thumb. Um, and so we're going to talk about more rules of thumb. Perfect. Uh, Let's do it. Right. And the next one, the topic that I wanted to bring in is this talk of recession. Are we headed for recession? Is that what's happening right now with the markets? Um, and the rule of thumb that we typically say and hear is that it's after two consecutive negative quarters of GDP. So negative GDP growth, two quarters in a row, first quarter, second quarter, or second quarter, third quarter, whatever it is, we need to see at least two where the GDP numbers are negative. And then that is going to be our, you know, indicator that we've been through recession. Doesn't mean that's when it stops, right? It can last longer than that, but right. you know, that's, that's generally the quote unquote rule of thumb. What is that definition missing? So that definition is missing is a lot, a lot. That is a rule of thumb that financial market participants we've been using for a very long time. Uh, we've we've passed that along to our clientele and to our friends. And and so somehow that became what what everybody believed was the definition of a recession. And it's not. The National Bureau Bureau of Economic Research 
is the, the organization that dates and determines when recessions begin and end. And they look at a number of different economic statistics, including labor, income, spending, production, those types of things. So it's a multifaceted analysis when we're dating. Um, what I would say is in the past, it has correlated pretty closely with, with that rule of thumb. Not exactly, but it's it's been a good, you know, like it is, it's a rule of thumb. It's like a broad kind of, you'll get in the right, the right area if, if you use that rule of thumb. Um, one of the things that has been disconcerting, I shouldn't say disconcerting, um, it's been a good thing for the U.S. economy is this year we're not, we haven't fallen into recession because of the labor market. Hmm. So the labor market has been very resilient, very strong. We've discussed it over the past couple of weeks. You know, the number of jobs available per unemployed worker is still very high relative to history. Um, even though it is coming down a little bit, it's still it's still a very resilient labor market. Um, you know, what impact is the the UA the the auto the auto automaker strike, the UAW strike? Do they broaden that to a number of different plants? Right now, it's a very focused small event like they're the, the uaw is trying to push a pain point on each automaker at one factory now that is a very small thing relative to what they could do and i i believe as i think the strategy goes is as they get further along in the strike they're going to start to do more and more plants until they're all gone if if they don't if the negotiations stall um and also the federal government government shutdown, which could happen at the end of this week. Um, you know, what does that do to the labor market? That could soften it fairly dramatically if these go on for an extended period of time, which could push us into a recession. And so it's one of the things that I think the markets, not only with the higher yields um, coming up, but I think it's also the uncertainty around the federal government shutdown and the UAW strikes, how that's going to impact consumer spending. Because if the consumer doesn't spend, the economy doesn't grow. And if mm -hmm. the economy doesn't grow, we're in a recession. So, you know, it's it's not the, the end of the world, but again, it's something to keep keep in mind. So this podcast always being targeted towards, again, our, our business owners, entrepreneurs, um, one of the things that I was talking about just this week, actually, um, is that, you know, we do live in a cycle, right? And the business cycle has its own life um, that it typically rides through. And we go through recession cycles. Mm, what is it? Every 18 to 36 months. Uh, on average. On yeah. average. Mm -hmm. So part of what we're talking about here and what I want to actually emphasize is that this, you know, we, we are talk, talking fairly um, minutely about like, okay, here's, here's this piece of data. Here's this piece of data. We're like talking about these things in real time and it can feel like, oh, what do I do? What do I do with this? What do I do with this? And do I need to be worried about this? And do I need to hunker down? Uh, in certain ways, right? So those those thoughts, those fears can kind of come up. And what I'd like to do is zoom it out and remind people that we go through this regularly. This is something that if you are, so I, I am in my late 30s, I'm going to hit, you know, I don't know how many more, 10, 20 more recessions in my lifetime. And the goal is to ride through it. The goal is to have a strategy that is sound and that is diversified in the right ways. We've talked, well, maybe we haven't talked about that enough, actually, on the podcast, what true diversification is versus like having large cap growth and large cap value and this kind of bond. That's not, that is a, a kind of diversification, but it's not true diversification. Um, and so truly when we're looking at 
what do we do with this information? It's you keep looking for the opportunities around you. As a business owner, you keep looking for opportunities to serve your clients or your customers. You keep looking for the right avenue to serve. And that's how you move through these recessionary periods. You, for for my clients, one tip that, you know, I mean, I think is pretty common knowledge is having cash cushions. It's not a financial planning uh, advice tip for anyone. I'm not going to put any numbers around it, but just having cash cushions, cash reserves, emergency funds, whatever you want to call it, having that there to support you through, yeah, it might get a little bit rocky a few months out of the year, but it happens regularly. And so when you plan for it, like, hey, this is going to happen either next year or the year after or three years after that, having something in place to help your business continue moving and thriving through is how you continue to stay in business. What do you what do you have in response to that? I would love to hear your thoughts. No, I think that's exactly right. I think um, if you have a long term plan, you know where you're wanting to go then setting up the fail safes, you know, that cash cushion is a great idea. Um, and I've talked to a lot of people about having the, the reason people get nervous about, in my experience, about equity market volatility is because they have too much at risk mm. because they are banking on all of it on equities or they're, so it's, they're taking too much risk in their portfolios for for any market other than a bull market. They love it while it's a bull market, but when things get a little, you know, when we go sideways or go down, that is where they start to get very, very concerned. And if you get concerned, it's an it, it indication you need to de-risk your portfolio a little bit. And having a cash cushion to meet your basic needs, if that's what you're doing is living on your portfolio, then having that cash cushion to get you through a certain period of time without having to pull from the portfolio is a very wise, it's a very wise thing to do. Mm. Oh, I love how you just broadened that to like, not just business owners, but literally anyone. Um, the, the coming back to the importance of um, what, what is typically called bucketing, right? Your, what's your, what's your bucketing strategy? Where, where's your cash bucket? Where's your short-term bucket? Where's your medium term bucket, where's your long term bucket? And just making sure that, yeah, if that long term bucket is in equities and it's volatile, or if that long term bucket is your business right now and you're growing your business, you still need your cash reserve, your short term bucket to be filled just in case that long term bucket takes a hit and needs needs some time, needs some grace to recover. Yeah. It's it's very rare I find people that should have a hundred percent equities um, in their portfolio, with with the exception. I mean, there are people obviously younger, up and coming, have lots of time left on their, you know, in their in their time horizon, if you will, in their lifespan. Um, but as people get to, you know, over fifty, it, it becomes a more difficult. Um, prospect to have a hundred percent equities and, and whether you should or shouldn't, I mean, you could be an aggressive, I, I knew a guy who was 90 and he was a hundred percent equities and he lived that way his whole life. Good for him, but that's a rarity. That's a, he's not the rule of the, the rule. He is the exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. And so most investors are going to want to reassess as they get older, as they start to live on that portfolio, how much risk they really do want in in that portfolio. And so most people determine, Hey, I need a little bit of fixed income. I need a little bit of, of cash cushion. I need some safety in there. Um, so I don't have to worry about it, you know? So, yeah. So you can allow, again, allow those longer term pieces to recover, right? That's the emotional, um, the behavioral finance and the emotional side of like, Oh, I'm watching my money go down. Like, and that's the, the freak out that can happen when it's okay. Let's look at it in a different view. That's the long-term money that's fluctuating right now. 
your short-term money is here and it's safe. Yeah. That's there's, a couple, there's a couple other perspectives too, what I, which I like to do is, is talk to business owners about, okay, if, if the equity market's going down, why wouldn't you sell your business? Cause that's the biggest asset you have, not your equities. And most business owners will come back and say, cause I make too much money off my business and it's, I can't sell it very easily. Right. And so those two things, one, they earn a lot of money from their business and two, the cost of transacting that transacting the sale is very high. So that tells you one thing is one, maybe equities should have a little bit more of an income component for that individual if they're worried. Okay. So if they're getting higher dividends or making three or four to five percent a year, they're not as apt to get rid of that portfolio during downtimes because mm. they know they're lo they've locked in a four to five percent average dividend yield. Um and two, it, it tells you that the low cost of transaction public equities is almost at times harmful to a client's in, in, in investment performance because they know it's cheap to get out of and to get in and out of different stocks. They think they should, and that's not the case. Ooh, that was, that was a really good point. I was like, wait, where's he going with this? Um, yeah. But yeah, when you came back around to that, yeah, like it it's easy. It, it is easy to sell, to sell your stock positions, right? Yep. Get the call, sell hundred percent. Done. It, it's a couple of buttons Yep. versus yeah. If you have to sell your business, like, Ooh, Ooh, no, uh, no, no, we're not doing that. Right. Like yeah. that's, that's going to be a lot of work. And so you <laughs> hold on to it. And so you allow it to grow. You allow it to ride through those downtimes for the upside. And that's really what, you know, in most business, most in, uh, business owners, you know, 50 to 70, 80% of their net worth is their business. And so that's why I always pose a question that way is because, well, if you really want to protect your balance sheet, which it sounds like you do sell your business. And that's where they, they can't like, that's where it shocks them a little bit with their thinking because of all the reasons we just went through. Yeah. I like that, that you're not, you're, well, maybe you are, but probably not literally saying like, I think the best option is to sell your business right now. But it's that again, the, like, let's ask, pose some questions that are going to get you thinking in a little bit different direction or thinking in a new way, opening up some perspective to what it really means to hang on to it. And my other, my other thought there is that entrepreneurs, um, business owners, you know, they tend to be very risk, um, risk forward in their business, right? Like willing to put a lot into it because they're the ones who are like, I'm betting on me in this. And I, I trust me and I'm going to bet on me and my own business. Um, and in that sense, when we're looking at your investment portfolio, let's, let's look at that. Let's look at the, the balance between, Hey, this is a lot of risk. Maybe we build the safety first with the assets that can come out where, you know, we're not going up necessarily 100% equities when you're also like going gung-ho gung and building your business as well. So just having a, having a understanding of all of the different assets that people actually have on the table and what the true risk profile is of each different thing and balancing accordingly. Yep, exactly. I mean, there are people, like I said, out there that are completely risk tolerant and good for them. It's just, that's, again, that's the exception of the rule, not the the rule. Well, I think next time um, I would love to kind of bring in your financial risk manager hat even more okay. um, and talk about what it means, what true diversification means. And I know uh, we may, we maybe have talked about this before, but it's been long enough that I think we can dive back in to you know, it's, what is it? What's true diversification? Is it diversification or diversification? Oh, there we go. And it I, depends not, on what you're doing. We're not calling it that. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for trying. 
Um, no, I love that. So next time we will talk about that next time, because I think that's a really powerful question for people to start to see their portfolios in a different way as well. Excellent. And I will put together a few, a few slides for the visual content. Awesome. Well, if any other questions come up, if you're listening and you're like, Hey, I had this question, send me an email or send me a DM on literally any of the platforms that you might see me on. Um, or send Brad an email, right? Like, let us know. We would love to address your questions. Um, and otherwise, we're just going to keep talking about stuff, whatever we feel like. Sound good? Perfect. This sounds great to me. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Brad. Thank you. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening and be sure to like and subscribe. And again, if anything resonated with you from this episode, I would love to hear from you. Email me at Hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H, at ExpansiveCEO.com and tell me about it. And if you're ready for your greatest expansion, you can find ways to work with me at ExpansiveCEO.com and at XSquaredWealthPlanning.com. That's X, the numeral two, WealthPlanning.com. So until next time, remember that there is enough, you are enough, and your birthright in this lifetime is to be expansive.